This week on The Communicators, a discussion on the Supreme Court's decision to hear a case regarding the use of curse words on broadcast television. Carter Phillips represents Fox Television, and Robert Sparks is associated with the Parents Television Council. Please note this program contains language that might be considered offensive. Well, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear an indecency on the airwaves case. This is the first time in about 30 years that this issue has been before the high court at the level it will be at. That's our topic this week on The Communicators. Joining us are two lawyers who are intimately involved in the indecency issue and in this case. Carter Phillips is an attorney for Fox Television, and Robert Sparks has filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Parents Television Council. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on The Communicators. We appreciate it's a pleasure. it. Pleasure. Nice speaker. Mr. Phillips, uh, we've heard so many different cases re regarding indecency on the airwaves. Exactly what case is the Supreme Court going to be hearing? The, s the specific facts in this case are an instance in which Cher at a, an awards uh, ceremony was specifically talking to the audience and, and describing her critics. And in that context, uh, she used the expression, fuck them. And then uh, the year later, uh, Nicole Ritchie uh, at the same awards ceremony uh, used similar language uh, in connection with just the intro uh, to uh, handing out an award. So those two instances of uh, that word being used, how did it become a Supreme Court case? Well, first the FCC uh, issued a ruling sometime before these, these actions took place, or actually the ruling came out after, but came up in the context of, of a previous ruling uh, involving Bono's comments, uh, in which he again used the word fuck as well. And uh, based on that ruling, uh, the commission uh, sanctioned or criticized the uh, Fox television for what it did in this particular case in these two instances. Uh, Fox, uh, along with other networks, uh, challenged those rulings um, in the Second Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals in New York. And the uh, Second Circuit struck down uh, the sanctions or the, or the condemnation by the FCC. The Federal Communications Commission uh, sought certiorari, which is the way you get a case in the Supreme Court, and the court granted cert uh, last week. Uh, Robert Sparks, another attorney, are you pleased that the Supreme Court has taken this case? Yes, we are. This is a, this is a fight that has been brewing for some time. Um, you have to understand that what's before the court is the right of broadcasters using the airwaves, the publicly owned airwaves, to broadcast what they want. This is not about what you see on cable television or direct uh, satellite TV or anything like that. This is about the publicly owned airwaves. Yes, we are glad. Um, the networks for some time have been, it seems to my client, the Parents Television Council, spoiling for a fight. Um, they seem to be looking for a case to bring, and they found one here. I think it was unwise of them. These are bad facts for them. Um, <clears throat> the networks were on fair notice before the 2002 um, Billboard Music Awards that um, entertainers shouldn't use these words. Uh, Cher went ahead and used it anyway. A year later, almost to the day, the 2003 Billboard, Award, Billboard Awards, Fox again put on the same show. They even teed up the presentation of an award by having Paris Hilton warn Nicole Ritchie not to use dirty words. The very next sentence, Nicole Ritchie used both the word fuck and shit, entirely gratuitously. That was it. And the FCC went after Fox, and long story short, we are where we are today. It, it, the use of the word fleeting, that's been one of the words used in these cases. Um, these were just fleeting expletives. It wasn't as if uh, there was a long string of them. Is that an argument to be made against your case? In this instance, involving these utterances, yes, the words were fleeting. But the FCC's guidance on this is not limited to fleeting utter utterances. Um, <clears throat> it looks at the entire context of what was said, where, when, and why. In this instance, although it was a fleeting expletive, the Commission looked at the entire context and found that what Nicole Ritchie said in 2003 and Cher said in 2002 was entirely gratuitous and unnecessary and therefore indecent. 
Um, according to news accounts and the FCC, uh, only about 300, 350 complaints came in from across the country, most from the Parents Television Council. Is, is there a level of angst about the issue of expletives on television? Well, I think there is. Um, you know, I, I often hear complaints that a lot of these um, complaints to the FCC are generated by the Parents Television Council. It doesn't seem to, to us that it should matter uh, when a crime is committed, whether the victim complains or whether a neighbor does or a passerby. Um, the fact is, enough people are troubled by what they see and hear on broadcast television that they file complaints. And having filed them, the FCC looks at them and, in this case, found them to be meritorious and proceeded against the broadcasters. Carter Phillips, is the word fleeting uh, advantageous for your case? Oh, absolutely. If for no other reason than when the Supreme Court upheld at least some portion of the FCC's indecency regime back in the late 1970s, uh, Justice Powell, who was the swing vote in that particular case, specifically said that in saying that the uh, a particular broadcast that was uh, offensive in that context was was could be permissibly regulated by the FCC. That that the court was in no way suggesting that it would have the same reaction if the expletives were were simply a, a fleeting use of them. So yeah, it should make a huge difference, even by the court's own language, in the 1978 Pacifica case. But as Mr. Sparks said, uh, the entertainers were warned ahead of time and the networks were put on notice that these words would not be accepted yet they went ahead and did it again well I, I actually I, I probably take some issue with Bob's characterization of that the, the reality is, is that from 1978 until well into the past the you know 21st century the FCC has uh, unenthusiastically maybe but nevertheless consistently uh, allowed various expletives, various fleeting expletives to be used without any issues and, and you know much harsher, much more repeated, much more uh, in some sense, uh, at, at least to some segment of the population, probably offensive and never taken action with respect to that. So uh, I'm, this is a, a completely moving target in terms of where the FCC comes out on this. I mean the truth is, you know, as we sit here today, you know, Saving Private Ryan, which uses all exact, exactly that same language, is is fine, no problem there. Uh, a, a a a documentary about uh, blues performers who use the same you know use exactly the same language that's struck down. That's impermissible. And the reality is, there's just no way to know in advance what it is that the FCC is going to decide. You have five uh, political types sitting in Washington who sit there in response to 300 uh, you know c criticisms or complaints, and they get to pick and choose which ones they want and which ones they don't want. I don't think that's quite fair. Um, <clears throat> the networks used to know how to behave um, when they broadcast things for years. We all watch television. We're not subjected to words like those used in this case and in other instances that are not currently before the court. Um, but there seems to be, um, among some people who talk on television, the love, love of the words that we're talking about, the F word and the S word. Um, <clears throat> the broadcasters, it seems to me, know when to edit themselves. Uh, for example, just this week and last, we've seen lots of public debate about Senator Obama and his connection with his uh, minister, Reverend Wright. Um, the broadcast of Reverend Wright's um, sermons have included the N-word. And he doesn't use the N-word, he actually uses the word itself. Uh, but when he does, the networks have bleeped it out. What's objectionable about that? I haven't heard anyone squawking. I haven't heard the networks complain that that's onerous. They have decided on their own not to do that. Well, okay, but there, you know, there's a fundamental difference. I mean, you've got you're talking about taped replays, and you can sit down and you can edit the tape however you want. We were talking about live broadcast, so you know, it's not like you're sitting there. I mean, the reality is that when Nicole Richie gave her talk, there was an effort. Indeed, the the first use of an expletive was bleeped. So unfortunately, the sec the second and the third were not. It's not as though the networks have been sitting I mean, you, you characterized it earlier as they were, they've been sort of picking this fight or looking for an opportunity for this fight. The reality is that, you know, in the 10 o'clock time span, anywhere from 10 o'clock until 8 in the morning, it, the networks have been free to use expletives without any regulation whatsoever. And yet, if you watch late night TV, you don't hear expletives running out. It's not as though the network is living for this. The reality is that there, you know, these things happen. It's part of the language of our society. 
And there are a lot of situations in which an occasional use of an expletive isn't, shouldn't, and shouldn't be regarded as offensive, putting aside the fact that we have a First Amendment right well, here. I, I think you're making my point. Uh, these things do happen, and they happen often enough that that work can and should uh, take steps to ensure that they don't go out on the airwaves. There's very little uh, real-time live television anymore. Um, it is easy to have a tape delay, and indeed most so-called live broadcasts do have a several-second delay. Um, uh, Carter was just making my point when he said that uh, in the Nicole Ritchie case that the first, uh, the first expletive was bleeped out. Why couldn't the others have been? Um, and as I said, they were on fair notice in 2003 that this might happen because the very same broadcaster had it happen the year before, almost to the day, in the very same show. Uh, Mr. Sparks, um, Carter Phillips argued the case before the Second Court of Appeals uh, in December of 06, the case that's now going to be going to the Supreme Court. Here's a little of what Mr. Phillips had to say, and I'd like to get your response. At, at the end of the day, though, in response to Judge Laval's question, which is, do I think personally that you can, that you can regulate this kind of speech Ever. consistent with the First Amendment? The position is no, I don't believe so. But if the court wishes to give the commission an opportunity to try to undertake to make that kind of a showing, if there's a bubble child out there and that child will be hugely disturbed by exposure to a single word, I mean, to me that is utterly implausible. But I suppose if the commission wanted to make some effort along those lines, And that's then what you'd be looking for, their, their argument that they really are preventing harm to an identifiable population. That would have to be what they, the, the, under Turner, they have to sustain that. They cannot simply posit the existence of a harm and assume that whatever they're doing is, is responsive to it. They have to make a showing. Mr. Sparks. I disagree with what Carter said there in the, in the argument, and I, I don't think it's the law, although I concede that the Second Circuit bought his argument. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that the FCC needs to put on record evidence, psychiatric testimony, um, documentary proof that children exposed to cursing are sometimes and some uh, sometimes harmed i just don't think that's what the law requires uh, it seems to me the better test and what the law requires is that we know as a matter of common sense that the ongoing coarsening of our public culture is affecting the young people in this country and the broadcasters are contributing to that coarsening and shouldn't be allowed to do it well, I mean, the problem with that is it just sort of throws the First Amendment out the window, which, I, you know, I just think the court's going to have to deal with that. I mean, it's part of the reason why the court didn't say in Pacifica, you know, that consistent with the First Amendment, the FCC can regulate anything. I mean, is it, Pacifica is the George Carlin case. Right, that's the George right. Carlin case. And they said, look, you have a shock treatment kind of an approach, and you have a sustained in the middle of the day and with no notice, et cetera, that, that, that's one thing. But if you're just talking about pleading expletives, the, the First Amendment candidly protects that. And, you know, I guess the question I'd ask Bob is, is, you know, why isn't the right answer to this to say that it shouldn't be the network's burden to sort this out? I mean, there are wonderful technologies available that parents can use to decide which programs they want their children exposed to and which ones they don't. I mean, isn't the entire nation is going to undergo a change on its television in the next few months because of HDTV. I don't know why the Parents Council and every other group like that isn't out saying, and as part of that process, every one of you ought to be educated about the V-chip and how to use it and how to effectively prevent your children from being exposed to that. It seems to me that's the solution to this problem. I, it's consistent with, with the you. First Amendment. I agree with you that technology is important, but let me turn that around on you. It seems to me that the networks, which are using the publicly owned airwaves for free, ought to use their technology to avoid this kind of language out on the airways. The, the Let's with also that, talk but, about the V-chip. But, but, but let me just respond to that quickly. Because, sure. I mean, the truth is, you know, saving Private Ryan's out there, the FCC is going to allow that TV show to run with the language in there. If the children are going to be exposed in the way you're talking, it's going to happen anyway. And there's nothing in any regulation out there that remotely stops that. So all I'm saying is, if, if you're going to have some of that language out there, then it seems to me the answer is going to have to be. Because it's going to be impossible for the networks to know, you know, when is Private Ryan, Ryan okay and when is some other TV show not okay. Parents can make that judgment on an individualized basis each time, what they want to expose their children well, to. That's too easy. It sounds to me well, like that's easy. an argument for the broadcasters to say, we can put anything we want out there on the public airwaves, and if you don't like it, don't watch it or run it through a machine. Why should we have that kind of, of uh, language broadcast into our 
living rooms over our publicly owned airwaves and you all have no responsibility at all because that's what I'm hearing. Mr. Sparks, does this, in any way would this affect cable? Do you think that cable should also be regulated? It is not now regulated. Right. Uh, uh, Parents Television Council is active in the cable area and is pressing um, the media companies to watch what they say there and they're doing so by pressing their advertisers. But the statute right now does not apply to cable. Mr. Phillips, do you think that the broadcasters should be held to the same standards as cable? Yeah, well, we certainly shouldn't be held to a lesser standard than cable. We're, the, we're exercising Are you essentially now? the... No, well, 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 I mean, in some ways that'll be the issue that the court will decide. But, you know, the, the, it's clear that this kind of an indecency regulation can't be applied to the cable industry. So to the extent that there's some question as to whether it could be applied to us, so yeah, that, that there's a separate issue there. I mean, there's no question the FCC exercises that authority over us and not cable. You know, that'll be the issue is whether that is consistent with the First Amendment. Eric Miller is an attorney for the Federal Communications Commission. He argued the other side of the case in December of 06 at the Second uh, Court of Appeals. And here is what he had to say, and we'll get a reaction from Carter Phillips. I mean, by, by Golden Globe's policy, what I mean is uh, the idea that the Commission has articulated that uh, the fleeting nature of uh, a reference does not immunize it uh, from the possibility of indecency liability. That idea is part of the Commission's analysis in its adjudication of these cases. So in reviewing those adjudications, uh, the Court can look at the analysis uh, that the Commission used uh, to reach those conclusions. Uh, what we suggest is not before the Court uh, is issues like uh, artistic justification, um, the, the issues uh, raised in, in, in other cases that are still pending before the Commission. Uh, all that's before the Court is what the Commission has actually done in this order, not uh, what the networks uh, are worried that the Commission might do in some hypothetical future order. Yeah, well, the problem with, uh, with Mr. Miller's approach there is that we're talking about First Amendment protected activities. This is speech. And when you're talking about First Amendment protected activities, you, you have to have more guidance than we're not going to talk about that and we're not going to tell you what the answer is to the hypotheticals. And in, and in some ways it goes to the, the whole question here is, on, on any given instance, is, instance, do you know whether or not that language is going to be permissible? Does, I mean, we can put this in concrete terms. Does C-SPAN, if it decided to broadcast this show on radio, which is a regulated and, uh, undertaking, the language I used earlier, is that, you know, do you bleep that out or don't you bleep that out? It's part of a news program. Presumably there's some argument that the context would make it a legitimate use, but I don't know the answer to that, and I candidly, I'm not 100% sure that whoever's going to edit this knows the answer to that either. I think Carter Phillips is a good enough lawyer to know that he could advise C-SPAN, if he were, um, that they could safely broadcast this over radio. Uh, without fear of the FCC coming down on them. Um, <clears throat> we'd have to remember that the Pacifica decision, what, the, the so-called George Carlin case back in 1978, I think it was, upheld the right of the Federal Communication Commission to prevent the broadcast of the two words that are at issue in this case. Uh, it seems to me that a, an urban myth has grown up around that case that somehow it really doesn't say what it does. That was a win for the Commission. Um, and what the Second Circuit did was in direct conflict with what the Supreme Court did in Pacifica. And I think that's one of the reasons the Court took it. I think the other reason the Court took the case was it has watched the coarsening of the culture. And uh, it reads the newspapers. And it saw that Congress in 2006 passed a statute that vastly increased the FCC's um, financial abilities to impose uh, liability on um, broadcasters. It passed, uh, I think, unanimously in the Senate and by a 10 to 1 ratio in the House and was promptly passed by the President. Uh, I think the Supreme Court has seen this fight coming too. Uh, I think these are bad facts, as I said, for the, uh, for the broadcasters, but um, here we are. Has the FCC, in your view, been consistent and a good marker to judge how far you can go? No, I don't think they have. I think Carter Phillips is absolutely right on that. Uh, they've been more or less asleep at the switch for the last several years. Uh, but because the constable was asleep doesn't mean he can't wake up now. The statute uh, says now what it has said all along. And uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, not least of them, the pressure put on by uh, Parents Television Council, the uh, Federal Communications Commission has uh, altered course and has now decided that they're going to enforce the statute um, in the way that it's written. Well, I mean, the fundamental 
question actually before the court at this point is 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 really the problem that's created when the commission you can say they were asleep at the switch i think what really happened was they they recognized that the first amendment constrains what they can do and they felt uncomfortable trying to enforce more aggressively in the period of time from 78 until much more recently and the difficulty is, is just as a matter of administrative law how agencies are allowed to conduct their affairs agencies are not allowed to say the world is x the world is x the world is x now the world is y without a very clear explanation for what has changed between point A and point B in terms of X and Y. And, and candidly, what the Second Circuit held, and all that it specifically held, is that the agency hadn't done an adequate job of explaining this sudden shift in its approach. And that if there are problems out there, it's, it's incumbent on the FCC to provide that explanation. So that's, you know, that's the narrow issue that's before the court. Uh, in this case, the broader issue, obviously, is what is specific to me. Will you be arguing this case before the court? I expect I will, yes. And will you use that argument? That oh you sure, just, absolutely. Just talked about. Yes. What's your strongest argument in your view? Well, I think that's that's the narrowest argument on which we can win the, the inconsistency. The, yeah, of the, the FCC? inconsistency, and that was basically the the ultimate decision of the Second Circuit. I also think there's a pretty strong argument that Pacifica is is it means what it says. It may have been a win for the commission, but it was a win on the narrowest of possible grounds. And they left open specifically the question of whether you can regulate fleeting exploits. What about the First Amendment that is argument? The first, that is the First Amendment argument, is because Pacifica was driven by the First Amendment. The question is, can you can you consistent with the first consistent with the First Amendment regulate fleeting exploits? Robert Robert Sparks, on on your on behalf of the Parents Television Council, you filed an amicus brief. What's the strongest argument in on in your favor? I think it's that. Um, <clears throat> The statute's always been on the books, and the fact that the FCC was, as I said, um, asleep at the switch uh, was perhaps a result of the fact that uh, in what we now quaintly call the good old days, say the last 10, 20 years, uh, the broadcasters were not putting out on the airwaves the sort of dreck they are now. Uh, the FCC woke up because the world changed, and it changed because the broadcasters now want to compete with cable, and they want to be able to say over the public airwaves what is said on cable. Um, if they are so constrained by what they can and cannot say on, on the public airwaves, I take it they should be willing to give up those airwaves and put their materials slowly, solely over cable. As a matter of fact, they're being a little disingenuous. A lot of the broadcasters own both the public airwaves and cable. There's no loss of artistic freedom here. Uh, we've seen, for example, with the Sopranos, those who think that that sort of language adds to the artistic value uh, of a show, are free to gravitate to Sopranos, and they did, and it was hugely successful. In the old days, where the only avenues of public expression over the airwaves were the airwaves themselves, even then the Supreme Court said you can, you can um, legally restrain that sort of public, th this, that's this sort of speech. Here, I think they definitely can. If you want to use those kinds of words in broadcast media, do it on cable not over the public see, airwaves. See, but the, the problem with that is, that, that, then that suggests, one, you, you don't show private, saving private Ryan. So you just say to some segment of the public that can't get access to the cable and otherwise can't go to the movies. That's just, you're just not going to see that as it was originally meant to be broadcast. Alternatively, the documentaries on 9-11, there's no question what language gets used in that context. Anybody who thinks that the, those words aren't going to get used in, in, in a setting of the, the most horrific event in American history is nuts. And, and, and what happened? Because of the efforts at regulation here, you know, a lot of broadcasters took that off the air. So if the question is, all fleeting expletives are off, you shouldn't be getting into this business at all, take it on the cable, then you're basically saying that you're going to make TV acceptable to a five-year-old and no, no more than that. No, I'm not. That's, by the way, the, the example you gave in Private Ryan and, and the, those who refused to broadcast some of the 9-11 footage, those were stunts in our view. We don't, we don't claim that you may never in any instance have that word somehow go out over the air. There are, of course, instances where it might even add to the artistic value. Private Ryan is a good example. And some broadcasters chose not to. I thought that was a stunt. Others chose to broadcast it, and it turned out they were right. The FCC said there's no problem in broadcasting Private Ryan, nor would there be a problem with newscasts. Um, the FCC's guidance on what is and is in, indecent is not as simple as you may not use these words. It's context, 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 everything. Carter Phillips knows that, and his clients know it. 
if the Supreme Court upholds the uh, Second Court of Appeals decision, um, what does that mean for the Parents Television Council? Well, it would depend on the grounds on which they upheld it. Uh, as Carter said, the Second Circuit decision was really, the holding was on a very narrow uh, basis under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, what they also threw in uh, gratuitously was um, there is frankly nothing the FCC can do to justify their pivot uh, that if, if they come back to us, we will find that what they did unconstitutional. So I think that the future of the Parents Television Council and what they can and cannot do will turn on what the Supreme Court does and how it disposes of this case. And if the Supreme Court uh, reverses the case, what does that mean for broadcasters? Well, I think they'll, they'll obviously have to move the frame of reference back away from this kind of language, take, you know, expend uh, significant resources trying to find ways to, to uh, be in a position to hit the button uh, more often and, and sooner. Uh, it may be the death of, the true death of any kind of uh, you know, live uh, broadcasting. I mean, you know, if you think about it, you know, you've got the, the Vice President of the United States on the floor of the Senate using these exact words. I mean, you know, what, are you going to bleep that? I mean, it's a, it, you know, the whole concept. I mean, it, it, it's all well and good to say, you know, these are stunts or whatever, but the reality is there's an awful lot of language out there, and nobody seems to contest that it ought to be there. And so then you're talking about a, a, a very, very difficult line to draw, and I'm, and I'm left back with why isn't the right answer to this, that one, the parents take advantage of the technology that's available and... and uh, try to prevent their children from hearing it that way, uh, not put the burden on the, uh, on the networks to limit their First Amendment rights and to, and to restrict and, and to make uh, to the, the broadcast uh, fit, you know, sort of the least common denominator of our nation. And finally, we've uh, talked about this is kind of the share case. Uh, is there a Bono case? Is there a Janet Jackson case? What about all these other issues that yeah. we've uh, heard about? The Janet Jackson case is pending before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. It's been pending for some time, and the court has not ruled. Um, the uh, Bono case uh, never really came to a court proceeding. It resulted in um, the Federal Communications Commission issuing um, an order, more or less putting the networks on notice that uh, henceforth you're not going to be allowed to talk like this. Um, that's what happened to those two. I don't know what, I don't know when the Third Circuit's going to rule on the Janet Jackson. And when is the Supreme Court case on this issue? I, I think the case will probably be argued in November. You'd expect a decision by no later than June of, of at the end of June of next year. Um, just as an aside on the Third Circuit, I noticed yesterday the Federal Communications Commission sent notice to the Third Circuit about the case about Fox and the court granting cert in that case. I don't know if that was sent as sort of a suggestion that they might want to wait until they hear from the Supreme Court before they decide that issue. Or there was a nudge to get them to decide. Yeah, you don't know which you, way you it was designed. <laughs> Gentlemen, we are out of time. Thanks so much. Carter Phillips is the managing partner for Sidley Austin. It's an international law firm, and he's based here in Washington, D.C. He's also an attorney for Fox Television. Presumably, we will be arguing the case before the Supreme Court for Fox. Robert Sparks has filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Parents Television Council. He is a member of the Sparks and Craig law firm out of McLean, Virginia. Gentlemen, thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure.